If you could turn your attention back toward, toward the front, uh, we would like to resume our program. Please enjoy your meal and keep on eating, but uh, we want to move on. We'd like to begin our program by recognizing a number of special guests that are with us. Over the last 28 years, we've made great progress in downtown in our central city. And this absolutely would not have been possible without the excellent help of our elected leaders. We have a number of leaders with us today. And so if I could, I'm going to introduce these folk and I ask them to stand. And if they'll just stay standing and then uh, we'll just sort of recognize everybody uh, with our applause at one time. Let me start with uh, state level government. Uh, Representative uh, Carol Alvarado is, is with us, uh, who certainly in her role with the city and even current roles had a lot to do with downtown and its redevelopment. Representing Harris County government, just stay standing, uh, in addition to Judge Emmett, who we'll introduce in a moment, Chris Daniel, our, our Harris County clerk, district clerk, Vince Ryan, our county attorney, Don Sumners, our Harris County tax assessor collector, Stan Stannard, the Harris County Clerk, and then from the City of Houston government, in addition to the Mayor, we have Steve Costello, Council Member at Large Position 1, Sue Lovell, Council Member position, uh, at Large Position 2, Melissa, excuse me, Melissa Noriega, Council Member at Position at Large Number 3, Ann Clutterbuck, Council Member District C, Wanda Adams, Council Member District D, and James Rodriguez, uh, Council Member District I, who has downtown in his district. And then from other cities, the Mayor of Bel Air, Cindy Siegel's here, so if you'll please stand and join the, everybody else. And then from Metro, we have two appointed officials, Gilbert Garcia, the Chair of Metro, and his, one of his uh, colleagues on the Metro Board, Christoph Spieler. And we appreciate all that you do, and now let's applause for all of these elected and appointed officials. And in, in addition to these distinguished guests, uh, I want to recognize our, our members. Uh, you have in your program a listing of our members, and um, we wouldn't be here but for you, and we deeply appreciate your all's incredible support uh, over all of these years and during the last year. Um, let me recognize you and recognize yourself, please. As I think everybody in this room knows, there's a number of different organizations that work together in this sort of pursuit of, of transformation of our downtown. Um, and I want to just have the directors of the boards of these organizations stand as I call them out. Buffalo Bayou Partnership, Discovery Green Conservancy, the Downtown Redevelopment Authority, the Houston Downtown Alliance, and the Houston Downtown Management District. And if you'll please stand and let us recognize you, board members, for your service. Now, we're very pleased to thank our underwriters for this annual meeting. In fact, I think this year's been a record, and we are deeply appreciative. A list of our underwriters is running on the screens. And if you'll take a note of them, we would appreciate it. Uh, we want to thank all of you for making a, this meeting a major success. So let's, let's recognize these folks as well. Our chair, in just a second, will recognize our, our directors of the organization. I would like to sort of deviate from the script for a moment to recognize and thank the staff of our organization and our allied organizations for what you do. Well, you do an amazing job, and I'm so proud of, of what you do. And so if we could, let's recognize these staff members. You'll stand wherever you are. You may not even be in the room. And then finally, one more, just a note of personal privilege here. Let me recognize my wife, Gail, who's been very patient with, with this pursuit for now 28 years. Gail. It is my pleasure to recognize and introduce Central Houston's chair, 
to lead the business portion of this meeting. Chip Carlisle is well known to all of you, and we are deeply grateful for his leadership of our organization. I have found Chip is so engaged, incredibly supportive, and incredibly creative, and we are very, very grateful for that. I think, as all of you know, he serves as the president for the Texas region for Wells Fargo. He has a distinguished banking career, and I think what's great about it is it's all right here in downtown. He's a native of Beaumont. He loves this region, as you know, and with his leadership, he constantly is giving back to this community, and we're so delighted he's benefited us as the organization of Central Houston. So please join me in recognizing Chip Carlisle as he comes to the podium. Well, Bob recognized the staff, but let me uh, recognize Bob. I, I know that as, as I've talked to you as members, you've all uh, expressed to me, uh, you know, your heartfelt concern about, you know, what do we do at some future point way off in the distance when uh, Bob decides to uh, not do this anymore. So uh, we just keep talking Bob into keep doing this. But he is just a tremendous visionary for our community. He loves Houston. He loves what he does. Uh, he loves representing you and becoming uh, you know, your voice in so many aspects of our of our community. So if you just take one moment to help me uh, express our gratitude to Bob Urey for the fabulous job he does. Okay, and I know you're wondering what is this apparatus on my right hand side and uh, uh, just to avoid another dozen questions on the way out, I had rotator cuff surgery, and uh, I'm in the process of, of recovering. But I've always said, and I've got have friends who say the same thing, that if you're ever going to get hurt, or if you're ever going to injure yourself or do something stupid, uh, Houston is the place to, to be because we have the finest medical care anywhere in the world, and uh, I've been a recipient of that, as I know many of you have. I also know that Houston has many other things that we're proud of, but particularly in this environment today when we look at uh, the nation and the concerns that we have about jobs, and I'm sure you were as proud as I was when the Bureau of Labor Statistics came out last month and said Houston again ranks number one in the entire nation above all 100 cities in the category of, uh, uh, of looking at job growth with uh, with our city continuing uh, to find ways to, uh, to provide employment. That's not to say people are not hurting, because we know that they are. We know that there are people looking for jobs. We know that there are people that are losing their homes, and that's certainly the environment that we're in. But of all places that I would want to be at this particular point, there is none better than our city of Houston. And uh, I know each one of you do your part to make it that way. Okay, we have a brief business meeting, and I said that I would be brief today, so I'm going to try my, my very best. Uh, on the uh, tables in front of you is a list of our directors. We took a, a uh, proxy vote among the memberships prior to uh, this meeting, and those directors' names, as listed in the program in front of you, have uh, been elected and uh, re-elected. Uh, as noted by the asterisks uh, by their name in the list. But if you would like to see the list of names of your directors to serve uh, for the coming year, they are, um, they are, they are on, the, on the table in front of you. But at this time, I would like to have all of the directors of Central Houston please stand and be recognized. Would you please? A tremendous group, and I am so honored to to serve with them. Let me con let me conclude, and and uh, just with a, a brief reference on on our focus uh, as a group. We we continue to remain uh, interested as an organization in those elements that provide access to the central city. We're concerned about transportation. Uh, we're concerned about uh, the arteries and the, the functionality of all the transportation methods because we realize that the heart of this city is very much dependent upon the workforce and the workforce ability uh, to be able to access the central city as well as uh, all the other entertainment venues and uh, 
all aspects of what the heart of Houston is, is all about. So that remains a priority for our organization. We also recognize that in economic times like this, that uh, there are those that are uh, in need of, of assistance, and particularly the homeless is an element that we continue to hear from our membership. And uh, Central Houston uh, has continued to make this an area where we are engaged and we are uh, at the table trying to, uh, to help and serve in any way that is possible. But that, too, remains an item of significance that, uh, that we uh, visit virtually every single meeting as, uh, as, as we address the needs. And then finally, the planning aspects of our city is another area of focus. Pam Gardner has done a tremendous job working with uh, our members and interested parties in laying out a strategic plan for Central Houston that um, will really help us to, to make sure that we remain focused on things that are, are far into the future for our city. And uh, we're, we're just delighted with the progress. You'll hear more about that next year, uh, as well as uh, various aspects of an updated overall plan for the downtown area as we look at such things as uh, George R. Brown and the long-range planning of it and uh, various aspects of our community around that. So there are a lot of things that are on our plate. I won't get into all of them. That's not really our purpose today. We're always here for you and want to hear from you uh, as members. I want to conclude by thanking uh, you for your participation, by thanking you for your involvement and your support your continued financial support and your volunteerism. I believe great cities are made by people willing to serve and give of their time, and certainly you do your part for Houston, and let me express my deep gratitude. Thank you. I'm going to turn the program back over to Bob. Thank you, Chip. And we, again, are just so grateful for your service to our organization. This year, we have decided to sort of focus this event really on the role played in our community by great parks and public spaces. Without a doubt, we as Houstonians benefit from these wonderful public places that our civic leaders have created. Some of that goes way back. Herman Park, Memorial Park, what great treasures in the community. However, however, I think as we kind of look back over the last 50 years, this region really kind of has grown like a weed, which is a great thing. Uh, but I felt like in the parks area, we were probably pretty much racing to keep up with our parks and public spaces. And we've made incredible progress and it's that we can celebrate today. Now it seems that we're sort of turning the corner with some really visionary new parks and plans that have caused us to, to I think, raise the question, could we define Houston in our image here in Houston by our great public spaces and our great parks? So today, we really want to be able to focus on that. And as you know, recently, here in downtown alone, we've had Discovery Green, we've had the Sabine to Bagby Promenade complete and open. Last year, Market Square opened. County's just opened a new park, uh, a public plaza. So you put these together. But what's even more exciting is there's more plans on the drawing board. The new Buffalo Bayou Partnerships, exciting plans for Buffalo Bayou Park from Sabine to, to, to Shepherd, It's a $55 million uh, investment adjacent to downtown that really is poised to become a centerpiece for our entire city. Exciting plans are also underway for Emancipation Park, the Sister Cities Promenade, Tony Marone Park, all in the central city. The Bayou Greenways Initiative is boldly planning to transform 10 Bayou stream systems throughout our region into park space, which is easily accessible to the neighborhoods all along the other banks. The vision led by the Houston Parks Board is to establish an interconnected parks and trails linking all our people, parks, green space, neighborhoods, at the same time enhances air quality, water quality, reduces flooding, and stimulates economic growth. So clearly we know we are committed to creating more parks and public spaces and we feel these investments are important and worthy of our discussion today uh, as we go forward. We're really, again this year, so honored to have our two leaders of city and county government with us here. They are, the county and the city both are huge stakeholders in downtown, 
and also huge partners in parks and our greenway system. First, it's my pleasure to invite Judge Ed Emmett, the presiding officer of the Commissioner's Court, to share the highlights of the county's efforts in these regards. Harris County's four precincts operate, I may have a number wrong, but somewhere in the range of about 158 developed parks with over 23,000 acres of parkland, of course, in the four precincts. In addition, uh, those bayou rights of way stretch for miles and miles and miles and already are greatly used and even pose greater opportunities for the future. And then I mentioned just a moment ago, just here in downtown, literally within the last 90 days, a brand new one block plaza for us as jurors to enjoy and use when we're called as a jury. So Ed, without any further ado, let me invite you to the podium and we, we are grateful for you being with us. It's always great to follow Bob. He stands here and tells you all the things that I was going to tell you. <laughs> but I'm used to that. Back in the 80s, I ran the North Houston Association when Bob was here, and he does an absolutely splendid job. And he also knows that I don't script very well. And in my five minutes, I want to talk about something a little bit different. Uh, first, I do have to recognize the, the four county commissioners actually more than the four, uh, two county commissioners who have left office in the last year, have all done, I think, magnificent work in developing parks and green space throughout the county. And of course, the Harris County Flood, Co Flood Control District uh, works on that, those projects on a regular basis. So the county is actively engaged. But what I really want to talk about, since, see, I don't have to run for office for three years. So that, sorry Mayor, you can deal with that. <laughs> so I have time to read. And I've decided that I'm going to start reading about urbanism. Now why urbanism? Well, simply because if you look at Harris County demographics, we are the third most populous county in the U.S. I've mentioned that many, many times. But beyond that, since we all know Houston is the fourth largest city in the United States by population, if you took the unincorporated part of Harris County, where the county government and municipal utility districts are the only level of government there, that population would be the fifth largest city in the United States. It would actually outrank Philadelphia. So what I and county government have to get our hands around is the fact that we really do live and operate in an urban environment. And in that regard, when you're talking about parks and green space or a lot of other projects, it's going to require cooperation, not just between the county and the city, but between the surrounding counties, and it's got to take a public-private partnership. And if I started going down the, the list of all the possibilities, I would be here all afternoon and you wouldn't get to hear your wonderful panel. But clearly, an organization like Central Houston has to be part of that public-private partnership. Because when we talk about an urban environment as large as ours is, it's got to have a core. And that core is going to be Central Houston. And so it is incumbent upon the county, <clears throat> as, all, as it is with all levels of government, to make sure that we do what we can do to continue to make sure that the, the central core of this great urban area is vibrant. Because at the end of a decade or two decades or three decades, I want to look up, as probably do all of you, and see that this laboratory that we have here of a city and a county and a state that grew up after the automobile, that we can create parks and green space and make an urban living environment second to none in the world. And that's what we ought to all be about. And I know that that's what Central Houston is in favor of. 
And that's why I wanted to be here today. So thank you very much for what you do. Thank you, Ed. We appreciate it. We appreciate your leadership. We appreciate the challenge uh, because we do have a big future and a big challenge as an urban region. It's my pleasure now to introduce Mayor Anise Parker, uh, certainly a constantly uh, as supporting parks in our community and in our city during her 14 years of leadership uh, within city government. Um, I'm, I'm running the risk here of, of, of uh, stealing uh, uh, thunder, but the city has uh, the Parks and Recreation Department is steward for some 39,000 acres of parkland and over 350 developed parks and 200 green spaces in our region. That's a pretty big plate. And then even in downtown, there's other parts of the city. Now Houston First Corporation maintains other public places, public plazas. So we're all working together in partnership as, as we go forward. Um, there are a number of things that the Parks Department and our parks effort do that well beyond green space. And uh, uh, we have the second largest summer food program uh, in, uh, in, in America in our parks. Uh, the green space division, uh, management division, uh, uh, provides jobs, summer youth jobs, 325 youth. And over 5,000 green space volunteers provide services within our parks. And I could go on with statistics, but I know you'd rather hear the mayor uh, really kind of give her vision of parks and public spaces. Mayor, we deeply appreciate you being here. Thank you. I am happy to be here. Once again, and uh, everybody, I think, knows that I'm, I'm passionate about the city of Houston, and I love to talk shop, so that's what we're doing today. But before I, I talk about parks, I just want to remind us about some of the great things that are happening in other areas focused around downtown. In the area of sports and outdoors, the Dynamo Stadium is looking absolutely fantastic. I don't know if you've seen the, the shell going up. So on the east side of downtown, we have the Dynamo Stadium. And then along uh, the west side of downtown, along uh, Buffalo Bio, uh, the, the new trail systems are, are going in uh, before we even get to uh, the, the phenomenal plan uh, for uh, the Sabine to Shepherd stretch of Buffalo Bio that will begin to unfold over the next couple of years. In downtown, you see uh, the three new rail lines being launched, and uh, we just rolled out the Green Link, which will be a, a circulator service for downtown that'll start in the spring. In the area of the arts, of course, I was happy to be uh, for, there for the ribbon cutting for the new uh, home of the Houston Ballet, but uh, next month we'll have uh, movies back in downtown with, with the, the Sundance Theater, and we're very excited about that. Uh, of course, we're, we're in a, a city hotel, uh, but right across the street, uh, the, the new embassy suites, so adding to the hotel space downtown, adding to the, the options for uh, conventioneers, and then you can see the work that's being done for our future cultural tourism center with the historic homes uh, on the other end of the George R. Brown Convention Center. And then, of course, the Sister Cities Promenade, again just to our east and the city just inked an agreement with Azerbaijan for investment in uh, a new urban park facility on the other side of downtown so lots and lots of things good things are happening for the city of Houston now the bad news uh, hottest summer in recorded history in Houston worst drought in history in the state of Texas. Uh, I just had to go to city council with a estimate for the cost of removing trees, dead trees, dead and dying trees in the city of Houston, four and a half million dollars we set aside in a very, very tight, already strained budget to remove trees. You don't want to know the worst part of that? 
those damn tallow trees look better than ever. <laughs> oh, come on. But if you want to help in this effort, and on everyone's table, there's some information about helping us help the trees. Uh, we would really appreciate you working with one of the four entities, in addition to the city and the county that are, are struggling with this, either the Houston Parks Board, Trees for Houston, uh, the Herman Park Conservancy, and the Memorial Park Conservancy. We have uh, 17 parks in the city of Houston that are over 400 acres in size, and most of them are heavily forested parks. And uh, we are doing our best to keep them alive, but uh, unfortunately, there's only so much we can do, and we're going to have to replant, and we are determined to replant once the rains start again. So we could certainly use your help, and I appreciate the fact that Central Houston decided to, to not go with floral centerpieces today, make the commitment to being greener. Now on to, and now on to parks. Let's talk a little bit about some of the things that are, that are happening in our parks. And I'm, there's going to be lots of time to talk about what's happening along Buffalo Bile, but I love, I absolutely love the Rosemont Bridge. And if you haven't been there and looked back to see the view of downtown, you're truly missing something. And in fact, if you stand on the Rosemont Bridge, you can, and you angle it right, you don't see the uh, Occupy Wall Street protesters that have occupied Eleanor Tinsley Park. And when they're not at Eleanor Tinsley Park, they're outside City Hall at Herman Square, which is another one of our public spaces downtown. But uh, that is what public spaces are for. Uh, Market Square Park is already used more than we ever anticipated. And all aspects of Market Square Park are being used. It's uh, from, from the dog park to the contemplative uh, area of the, uh, the Katuzi Fountain to uh, those who want to dine out at Nico Nico's. Going away from downtown, but close, uh, we have now launched the first phase of the Emancipation Park project. Co uh, coordination between the uh, TERS, the city of Houston, money from the state of Texas, with the intention that that becomes another destination park for the city of Houston in the same way that Market Square has become a destination park for downtown and Discovery Green has become a destination park for the entire city. Keep your eye on Emancipation Park. We're also constantly, again, even in a very tight budget, looking for opportunities to take advantage of opportunities that may not come again. Uh, earlier this year, the city of Houston purchased the old Inwood Golf Course to save it from redevelopment because we believe it is an absolutely essential element for parkland, but also for detention and retention of uh, floodwaters going forward. So the city of Houston wants to preserve and protect our parks. We want to grow our parks and green space. And we also are going to take advantage of the new money that you're sending us through that uh, drainage fund you're paying into to make sure that we open up more green space for the city of Houston. As always, I appreciate the work done by Central Houston, and I thank all of you for being here today. Thanks, Mayor. We appreciate your leadership. You know, as we... Uh, taking a really a, a discerning look at the progress on our parks and, and public spaces, we actually had a, several questions that really kind of kept running through our minds. And, and uh, let me just give a few of them to you. What are the advantages of program public spaces and, and green space in our community? Are these places having a transformative impact, both economically and socially, in our community? Is there a potential for Houston to find new identity through its parks and public spaces? And, and if all of this is true and we want more, how do we sustain great parks? And how long would it take to really achieve, you know, kind of an ideal vision of, of, of what we could do in this city with our parks and public spaces? 
We decided this year to, for a program to go to a panel format, and we are thrilled with the panel that we have today to actually take these questions up and discuss them. We are deeply grateful to have a, uh, a moderator with us, Dr. Larry Faulkner, who's the president of the Houston Endowment. I think most of you know Larry, but uh, uh, he was a native of Shreveport, and he lived here for a brief period before spending 43 years in academia at Harvard University, Illinois, and University of Texas. And as you know, uh, he went to Texas uh, to become the president there in 1998. And then in 2006, um, both the Houston Endowment and Houston itself were very fortunate that Larry took over the president's role there at the endowment. And uh, Larry, let me just say, you've, your announcement of, with retirement that's coming up here, that we all owe you a huge debt of gratitude for your excellent leadership, both with the endowment, but also here in our community. So please welcome me and, uh, excuse me, welcome, <laughs> help me welcome Larry, Dr. Larry Faulkner to the podium to kick this off. Thank you, Bob. It's a great pleasure for me to be um, participating in this panel today, uh, to have the opportunity to moderate it on a subject that is so important to us. Uh, let me begin by introducing our panelists, and then I'll go take my place there as we get into the discussion. But um, we will start um, going for the far side of the stage and over. Uh, Fred Kent with the Project for Public Spaces. Fred is a leading authority on revitalizing city spaces and is one of the foremost thinkers in livability, smart growth, and the future of the city. He's the founder and president of, Pro of the Project for Public Spaces, which he did found in partnership with the renowned urbanologist William H. White. Fred has assisted over 2,500 projects in 40 countries in, and all 50 states. In downtown Houston, he played an integral role in the development of Discovery Green Market and Market Square Park. Next to Fred is uh, Catherine Nagel of the City Parks Alliance. Catherine heads the only independent nationwide membership organization solely dedicated to promoting an urban parks agenda. Since joining the City Parks Alliance in 2004, she has launched an advocacy campaign to increase public funding and has worked tirelessly to develop strategic partnerships with other national entities. Catherine has a master's degree in landscape architecture as well. Uh, now coming across the gap here, uh, let me introduce Yvette Bowden, uh, who is the director of Piedmont Park. Yvette is responsible for one of the most historic parks in the country, right in the heart of Atlanta. It is undergoing a restoration and a 53-acre expansion based on a total new investment of $70 million. Yvette was born and raised in New York City where parks were her only backyard. She also has experienced in the philanthropic sector having served as president of the ING Foundation in the United States. And the fourth panelist, the many people in this room will know, Brady Carruth of the Wortham Foundation. Brady's a pioneer in supporting parks and public spaces in Houston very substantially through his work on the board of the Wortham Foundation. Brady is currently president of that foundation's board. He is also the current chairman of Discovery Green Conservancy and has chaired both the Houston Parks Board and Buffalo Bio Partnership. As Bob mentioned, uh, this is a good time for us to take a discerning look at Houston's progress on parks and public spaces. We often look at individual projects and weigh their merits independently. 
but in fact, so much is happening in this arena right now that it's important for us to step back and to see the bigger picture. So today, with the help of these excellent panelists, we plan to explore a number of questions. Our goal is to uh, inform you, our civic leaders, on some key issues and some big questions. What makes a great public space? What is the impact of a great park or public space? Are we seeing a trend for creating more great spaces? And if so, how can we support and sustain the trend? So ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. I'll go to my chair here, but let's go ahead and let me pose the first question. Uh, it'll go to Fred Kent. Fred, in August, your organization for public, your project for public spaces named Houston North America's placemaking capital. Uh, what did you mean by that, and why is it important? Uh, placemaking has become a new agenda in cities all over the world. Uh, and placemaking is really about connecting into the communities and drawing out of the communities what those assets, those aspirations, and those ideas are. So rather than when I first started working, uh, I, one of my cities that I came to first was uh, Houston. And one of the plans that we worked on was Market Square. And we actually suggested that maybe there could be a market on Market Square. Brilliant idea. Imagine where that came from. Well, the Parks Department said, well, no, we can't have a market on Market Square because it's commercial activity. So jumping ahead to the recent past, and we were active in helping to uh, define the, the breadth of what Discovery Green is about and Market Square and Emancipation Park. So what we're applying, and you know, when you have the, the key in a city are zealous nuts. And one of the reasons we s selected Houston was because you have a lot of zealous nuts. <laughs> and that's what makes a city. These people are passionate. They're, they're almost foaming at the mouth when they talk about their love for Houston and what they'd like to do. And you're all here in this room, and you know who you are. <laughs> so uh, when Nancy Kinder came and talked to us, and she's on the, one of the top of those zealous nuts, as you know. You know, she said, well, what are we going to do in the place? Well, that's the big question. Instead of thinking about how you're going to design it, you want to think about what are the uses and activities. So then we say, well, a great destination, we don't use the word parks very much anymore because we're talking about sort of multi-use destinations that have many dimensions to them. What are the 10 places in Discovery Green and the 10 activities in each of those places? So that's what you saw come out of that. And then when it was designed, that's largely what happened. And it's still moving and progressing and evolving so that it becomes more and more that multi-use destination that is very green. Market Square is the same way. Emancipation Park is the same way. But take that to a whole other level and say, we need 10 of those dynamic destinations in the downtown. At a larger scale, we need 10. And of course, Herman Park is one of those uh, for the whole region. And uh, then you go back into a neighborhood, and you need 10 places in a neighborhood. It might be a street. It might be a schoolyard. It might be a library. Uh, so you start broadening the idea of what public spaces are to all of the community institutions. And those community institutions start becoming multi-use places. So our theme as we've been going around the world, I was in Australia last week and in Sweden the week before, uh, and I'll be in Toronto next week, uh, is how do you create this whole new agenda around public realm, uh, and how does that drive the value of your community? And we have this uh, phrase uh, someone in Buffalo, we were working, and someone came to me after we had a meeting, and he said, what you're trying to do is turn everything upside down, and I said, to get it right side up. So that's where you are. You are moving beyond the old idea of, let's go get someone from the outside, to let's see who we are on the inside, and how do we make that the future of Houston, and that's where you're going, and that's why we chose you as the placemaking capital because you are doing it somewhat independently. We're getting calls from people here that 
the, in this city to have us do something else so that it, the, the momentum is moving. So now think of it as an agenda around placemaking and place-based strategy for governance and you will def redefine your city in a way you cannot imagine. Thank you. Brady, you've been involved in funding parks and public spaces uh, here in Houston for 30 years. Uh, how do you feel about Fred's idea that Houston could be known for its public spaces? Well, I, I hope I don't start foaming at the mouth uh, while I'm up here. But, uh, um, I'm just very gratifying to hear Fred's remarks. It's, uh, we've been working at this a long time. I'm frankly a little uncomfortable being called a pioneer because so many people have come before me and uh, I'm not that old, but the, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, parks and green space in Houston were uh, looked upon at one point in time as land available for development. And that is all changing now with the advent of the uh, knowledge-based worker, the kind of people who uh, look at a place uh, based on the quality of life and then go seek employment there. It's a, it's a whole different world. And so this is layered in an element of economic development uh, attached to parks, and I think people are starting to recognize that. Oh, that's great. Yvette, uh, you operate an amazing place, founded in 1904, and now hosting more than three million visitors a year. A big number. It's a big number. Right now you're in the middle of a 53-acre expansion. I'm sure you've thought a lot about essential value in parks. Uh, what to you is the definition of a great place. What would you like to? I love this idea of parks or great spaces being um, you know, challenged to define themselves. What I find interesting is in Atlanta, Piedmont Park and the other spaces that we have are really evidencing what the city already is. You know, it doesn't really matter what we build if it isn't evidencing the culture, the diversity, the desire of the community. And although you can shift some of that by what you build, I like to think that the 53 acres and all the voices that went to its um, design are really evidencing what the city always wanted it to be. The, the park is over 100 years old. The conservancy that I manage is 22 years old. And this 53 acres has been there all along, adjacent and city owned and sitting for a large portion of that time um, as just blighted property. And so this opportunity to capture it, finish not only the Olmstead and vision, but influenced by some of the solutions we frankly need to do for better water recapture, to deal with um, some of the health disparity issues in the community, and, and frankly to give people more space in what is increasingly becoming a very, very dense portion of one of the fastest growing cities in the country. I think great spaces serve many purposes. It is exactly the flexibility you're referring to. Um, and I should not be building the thing or running the thing that is defining what it will be for people. They should be in the space amongst each other defining how the space will be used. Fred, this interfaces naturally with what you think about. Um, so you have follow-up uh, comments on well, what Yvette's just said. You know, the, I, I'm familiar with Piedmont Park, and I think it is one of the great parks uh, in North America. There's another one in San Diego that I've become really quite familiar with, and they get about 10 million visitors. It's called Balboa Park, and they get about 10 million visitors. But what's really interesting about it is that the average San Diegan goes there 7.9 times a year. So it's a park that is owned used and operated by also 7,000 volunteers that make that place so unique and so special uh, that it is a prize and people from the outside go. The other thing that's interesting is the cultures that use it. 45% of it are Latino Mexican uh, population uh, and the, the diversity is phenomenal in age and, and use and what they do in that place. Well, that's a place that's owned by the community. And what's so important about having that, so that's a little like Discovery Green. It's used mostly by locals, and then other people come and discover what an amazing place that is, and then they have a great feeling about Houston. It's the same thing with Piedmont Park. So building a local audience that has to come back because it's so special to them is what drives 
the pride of a community, it drives the image of the community, and it's what drives uh, the future, because that's where you go, and that's how you build the agenda for your city. Catherine, uh, the membership of your organization, City Parks Alliance, consists of core urban parks across the nation, many of them being the main identity parks in their cities. Uh, what are your members most concerned about, and how are you addressing the concerns? Well, they're most concerned about funding. Um, what we've seen um, over the, the last decade, and the reason why the City Parks Alliance was formed, um, is a uh, decrease in public funding, whether that's at the federal, state, or at the local city level. And so in the absence of those public funds, we've seen an emergence of a variety of public-private partnerships uh, to raise funds uh, for, for design and, and construction and maintenance um, and programming um, of these important uh, public places. Um, it's, um, it's, it's interesting because you know, we talk about the public-private partnerships, but there really is no single model. And uh, we're seeing um, public agencies work with public agencies uh, with uh, the collaboration of, of a nonprofit partner. Uh, we're seeing um, cultural institutions and um, healthcare providers working um, with city parks. So there's this, there's this whole new field of how parks are being supported. Um, we recently did a survey of the 60 um, signature parks across the country, which are the, the parks like your Discovery Green and, and Herman Park, to try and get a sense of how they're actually funded. Um, and what was uh, really surprising to me was that 95% uh, of them are leveraging philanthropic support, and that has been a significant, um, they, you know, the philanthropic community has been a significant player um, in uh, getting parks going and in fact in providing leadership around the green priorities of, of a city. Um, they're you know, raising money through grants and through you know, membership organizations and uh, through corporate sponsorships. Uh, Millennium Park have, in Chicago, if any of you have been to that, um, has been very successful in that realm. Um, a majority of these parks are raising money through earned income, and I know this is an issue that uh, Fred talks about, um, looking creatively at how you can incorporate concessions uh, into the park so that they are self-sustaining. Um, uh, many of them are, of course, relying on public funds, but starting to tap into sort of non-traditional sources of public funding, like transportation funds and, and um, housing. Um, so that's, that's a new trend. Uh, fewer are accessing infrastructure revenue, but I think this is an area of greater growth, um, looking at how you might be able to uh, get some revenue from um, underground fiber optic lines, or you know, what are the savings from uh, you know, stormwater management uh, that might be addressed through parks. Um, and finally, um, only about 15% re receive funds from real estate. And again, I think this is an area of potential growth. Very few parks, um, while they create revenue, I mean, we know that parks uh, increase the value of the surrounding property from between 5 and 25%, but very few parks are actually able to capture um, that increase in value. And so very few uh, groups are actually looking at how to create new uh, sources for maintenance and operations through real estate transactions. Some of them are creating new, new districts, you know, like the business improvement districts or special park districts, but again, this is, this is an area, I think, for great growth. Well, thank you. You've uh, raised uh, philanthropy as one of the elements in that picture. Um, so I'd like you and Brady to both uh, address the question um, that's related to philanthropy. Um, let me start with Brady. The, um, in the Houston scene, uh, Houstonians have turned to the major philanthropic foundations for decades uh, to help fund major parks and uh, public space development. Um, what are the deal breakers uh, that would keep a foundation from getting engaged in, in this sort of thing? Well, uh, anytime we're approached about a major capital gift, obviously the first thing you look at is how realistic is the capital raising prospect for this entity. Uh, but equally important is the plan for the ongoing maintenance and operations of the facility or park. Um, if there isn't a realistic, coherent, achievable 
uh, mission to raise these funds on a on go forward basis, uh, you know, we're not very likely to fund. Um, what we don't want to help create are institutions or parks that are going to have to come back to us year after year for significant operating support. I mean, there's, we don't have enough money to, to take on those kinds of projects. Um, so if they have a plan that seems like it's going to work, uh, we're at, you know, we're apt to support it. Um, that's one reason we were so excited about Discovery Green uh, and about the new Buffalo Biopark. Uh, there's a plan in place, a workable plan that we think is achievable. And so we've supported those, uh, you know, significantly. Uh, we don't want to try and dictate to the uh, grantee exactly what is going to go on in their facility or in that park. Uh, we want the public to determine what's going to go in that, uh, and what, what makes a, activates a space, what makes it a, a, a worthy investment of our capital dollars. And uh, while we don't want to dictate that, we will certainly take a good hard look at their operations plan, how it's going to be funded, and uh, we'll do our homework on that. And if it, if it doesn't seem feasible to us, uh, we're not very likely to fund. Catherine, you do deal with, um, with organizations across the country encountering these same kinds of issues. Do you have comments on the deal-breaking part of philanthropy? I don't think on the deal breaking, but I, what I'm seeing across the country are um, interesting strategies that philanthropic organizations are taking. Um, you know, as Fred talked about, the number of, of volunteers that that parks rely on now uh, for maintenance and for for programming. Um, those uh, volunteers. Uh, uh, require staff time of organizations, often nonprofits. Nonprofits need support, and so we see a lot of um, uh, you know community foundations and regional foundations supporting uh, the ongoing operations of local you know friends of groups and alliances. That's one area. Um, we're also seeing um, uh, the philanthropy community helping to drive long-term visions. Um, and there's some great examples of like the Hyde Family Foundations in Memphis um, and William Penn Foundation in Philadelphia that have been instrumental in uh, keeping the, that, you know, uh, that urban green agenda moving forward and, and bringing together the partners that are necessary to bring those visions to life. One interesting new area, and I would encourage everybody who's in the philanthropy world to think about, is advocacy. Um, because we need to ensure that, that parks are, are funded adequately. Um, and that's only going to happen uh, with, with the support of, of all of these, these, uh, you know, these players in these cities. So um, that's a new area. It's very hard to measure, uh, but I think it's critical uh, if we're going to uh, make sure that these places remain public and open. Thank you. Yvette, um, we've talked a little about uh, how people use um, public spaces. Um, how do you measure the cultural impact of a park? How do you? I think measuring you parks in general it? is complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly, if you, getting back to the deal breaker question, my largest donors hold me to a very high standard as a business person. I run a nonprofit and people come to the park every day without an admission gate. So being able to say you know, exactly how many people I'm serving has been a challenge. Here's, here's what, a couple of things that we're doing. Um, one is that we are doing impact surveys every year um, with, the, with an educational partner. So one of the local colleges has loaned me a marketing department class um, to just study the utilization, how many hours people are in the park, what did they come for? Did they come with a child? Did they bring a dog? Did they buy something? Which is really helping us understand how long people are in the park, who am I serving, what did they need? Um, I think being able to convey that and people's use of the park then helps me, frankly, write more um, meaningful and, and directly responsive grants requests because I know who I'm speaking about. Um, the other thing I think they measure is, did I do exactly what I said I would do with the gift? And, you know, that kind of transparency leads you to a relationship that you can then leverage. I think another measurement is also the, your ability to convert um, the value of a gift, whether it's time or treasure, um, into results. You know, being in a park and working in a park, as many of us do, 
um, is a very out there kind of world and people can definitely see the results of what you put in play. What I have to start capturing now, what's really exciting, particularly in a place like Houston where things are not only being rehabbed but continuously built is the new metrics. Um, I'm capturing now how much water, storm water recapture we have. If I use solar energy, um, how much am I saving the city in energy expenditure? How many cars are coming to the park versus came to the park before we reduce the interface between pedestrians and vehicles? Um, how much longer am I able to keep a tree alive because of the mulching and the volunteers and schedule we have with water? These are, I think, the things that will, that not only are leading Atlanta's parks into this conversation about sustainable sites, um, but otherwise. I can, it's hard for me to capture how many children, I can tell you it's a lot. Uh, how many, I'm swimming in children and dogs, but, <laughs> um, it, you know, it isn't so much about the, it's about the change. We, we have to start to be able to measure um, the, the viability and, and profitability and the survivorship of the surrounding restaurants, how much faster um, condos and homes are being sold and the, the values of the properties that are holding in the areas immediately surrounding the park. When we give an event that's our own event, like the Green Concert, which is our major concert fundraising that we do, I go out and man it. You know, how many seats did you have in your restaurant filled that night? How many restaurants? You know, these are the things that your stadiums and amphitheaters have done so well for years. But I don't have an admission gate that makes that easy, so I better get very creative about capturing that and, frankly, turning members from tweets in two dollars. Uh, <laughs> so I, I know that all of Georgia Tech is there on Thursday afternoon. <laughs> uh, but I also need to know, don't just tweet about us. Tell me what you loved about being in Piedmont Park and be part of this movement. Because as Catherine said, every dollar I'm able to leverage that a donor or a member generously gives us, I have to be able to convert that into sustainable change for the city. I think what we do enables the city of Atlanta to then take resources and expend in parks parts of the city that aren't as able to have what we have. That doesn't mean we need to replicate, I agree with you. Um, each experience needs to be exactly the same. Everybody thinks they want a Piedmont Park, but you really don't. Um, it, it, it is made for a richer conversation and much more collaborative efforts across organizations. Well, those were some interesting indices of impact. Uh, Catherine, how do you, uh, in your organization, define the economic impact? of a public space? Um, well, actually, the City Parks Alliance relies a lot on the, the work of the Trust for Public Land. Uh, Peter Harnick is on our board and runs the Center for City Park Excellence. And he has a, a long list of um, uh, values. He's worked out um, a way to measure the economic value um, with economists uh, that measures the value of, of tourism. You know, how many more people are coming to your city because of these, these destination parks? How much are they spending? So what, what kind of a tourism value does your park provide? What are the um, what are the health savings? If you have access to a park that's free, um, you know you don't have to pay a, a fee at a, a local gym. Um, that's a savings for a resident, but it also saves on the public health costs because we know that if people are exercising on a regular basis, the um, their health care costs um, go down. Um, obviously, there are the, you know the, the property values. Um, so there, what he's he's developed is, a, and I won't go through the long list of maybe ten to. 20 12 um, uh, different values that, that measure both the, uh, the, the increase in value um, to a city that a, a park provides as well as the municipal savings. Well, we're going to wrap it up now. I'm going to ask each one of our panelists uh, to address the question of uh, what their single piece of advice is to us uh, if uh, we in Houston want to make uh, parks and public spaces a priority for our future. Uh, I think I'll start with Catherine, go to Yvette, and then Brady and Fred. Catherine? So I would recommend that you think about your parks as a system and think holistically about how these parks function, how they work together, um, how they're, they're governed, how, um, what kinds of resources they're using, and how you might be able to leverage that. And that's from the destination parks uh, down to the neighborhood parks. But I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. You bet. 
agree. And, you know, leveraging your partnerships also means perhaps being more flexible. Um, we've enjoyed, and I, I applaud the work that's going on here, of starting to think of parks beyond the responsibility of the parks department and working with your departments of health, your counties, um, Department of Transportation. I love my watershed management folks uh, because we're solving larger issues um, and people want to be involved in that in their city. They want to know they're having that kind of impact, not only from a donor perspective, but in being able to save a tree and what that does for air quality or the heat index or things like that. So I think being out of the box about what it is that you can possibly solve um, or at least be a part of solving in the city and, and part of your visioning and what you can do there. Well, I think uh, Houston, as I said before, has made tremendous strides in the, in the appreciation of parks and uh, we're very fortunate to have city and county government that uh, understand and appreciate uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, we have a philanthropic community that uh, recognizes the uh, importance of parks and green space and how they enhance the social fabric of our city. And we have a business community that is uh, starting to more and more understand that you know parks and green space are uh, you know determination of determining factors of, of economic development. And we're not where we need to be yet, but uh, we're certainly moving in the right direction. Fred, well, I think uh, I want to think big with you, uh, really big. Uh, just take the idea of public realm and imagine what it really is. It's your streets, uh, it's your libraries, it's your school, uh, it's the, the churches and synagogues and mosques. Uh, those are all part of the public realm. So if, if we rethink the role of all of those, if we also have an agenda around creating a square or squares, many squares uh, in neighborhoods, uh, say the squares in the in the uh, schoolyard, a community square. Supposing it's around the library. Uh, supposing it's part of a church. Uh, yesterday I was meeting with the people who are leading the, uh, the downtown library. That library can become a town square for the city around uh, the library issues, but also around community development issues, around growth, about uh, turning uh, the spaces into markets, different kinds of markets. My favorite market in the world is a kids market. One day a year in the Netherlands they have the Queen's birthday and you see these uh, four, five, ten, twelve-year-old kids come out and they're the only people that are allowed to do economic activity on that particular Sunday. So have those around the libraries or in the schoolyards. Turn the streets into public spaces. Imagine a street being a public space which is defined more by the community than it's defined by the traffic engineers. We used to say whatever a traffic engineer says, do the opposite and you'll be building your community. Well, just imagine if 30% of the land of Houston is in streets, just imagine what you can do as you transition away from driving traffic through these places faster uh, to an improved capacity to saying, wait a minute, only maybe 20% of those streets need to be that capacity, that, that purpose. We're working in, uh, in San Antonio and we're rewriting the whole street design guidelines because we don't need all these big streets moving all this traffic so fast. So you can reclassify your streets to become public spaces again. Uh, we talk about architecture of place, uh, turning a building inside out, go back to the library in this downtown. Supposing you take the ground floor of that, or a good portion of that, uh, and turn it into a market, a night market, a day market. The outside becomes this amazing exposition place for the communities that make up uh, Houston. So you're redefining the whole idea of what the public realm is. And what you're actually doing, we call placemaking, is creating jobs. Because you can use these places to create those local entrepreneurial settings that markets have done time-honored everywhere in the world. So rethink the whole idea. Move away from just parks and even the term public spaces to thinking about how do we create great public destinations that are defined by people in the community around their assets, their community assets, and then don't use an outcome 
uh, that may narrow the potential of what that is. And you will be amazed at what the creative people in every community can come up with. We did a book called How to Turn a Place Around, and the first of 11 qualities is the community is the expert. And the second one is you're creating a place, not a design. And the third one is you can't do it alone. And the fourth one is the one I kind of like the most, I like them all, uh, is uh, if they say it can't be done, it doesn't always work out that way. And that's always been our motto because the biggest obstacle in communities, in cities, are siloed disciplines, siloed agencies uh, that don't allow the diversity of a community to come into it because they don't want, they want to maintain their discipline, focus on what should happen in that community, not allow the community, which has a holistic approach, to become the engine of what that community can become. So as you move away from this siloed approach to a place approach, you actually become an engine of opportunity, of economic actions, of local economy, and building a local economy, and ownership in those places that goes way beyond anything that you've seen in this wonderful city of Houston. Thank you. Um, colleagues and friends, uh, we've been most fortunate to be able to draw from the wisdom and knowledge and enthusiasm of uh, these four uh, great panelists. Let's thank them for their contributions. I have to wipe my mouth off Fred, get the foam off, okay? Uh, panel and moderator, let me thank you, Larry. Let me thank you all for a great job well done. Yvette, Catherine, Brady, Fred, Larry. Another round of thanks for them. They're just fabulous. Joe Turner, our parks director over here, must feel pretty good to be in a room full of zealous nuts about parks, okay? Um, it's, but it's uh, indeed. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful time to really take a few moments out of everybody's busy lives and really think about what parks can do in our city. Um, I would like to, uh, uh, in addition to our panel, thank other participants, our chair, our board, and our membership that are with us here today. If you're interested in learning more about Central Houston, uh, centralhouston.org, you can go on the web and you can find out more about us, and we have hoped you've enjoyed this. But finally, in conclusion, I want to thank all of you, just starting up here and going around the room, because you look around and see who's here, for your continued dedication and support and just um, uh, true you know, uh, 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 commitment to, to making this city and this region an absolutely wonderful place. So um, we want to go forth from here. We've got plenty of work to do as we head to the future. We want to thank you for joining us and have a good day.